So I pitched a tent in Skyline Park, which is about two miles from my winery. And in the middle of the night, an earthquake hit, and I had no idea what was happening because I'd never experienced any such thing. And nobody had ever actually discussed that I should be prepared for any such thing. <laughs> I was kind of pissed about that, actually. <laughs> California should come with a disclaimer. <laughs> On your Southwest Airlines flight, behind your seat back, it should actually say, Do you, are you prepared for an earthquake? <laughs> anyway, um, I, I was sleeping in this tent, this two-person pup tent, right? Because I'm not rich, and I don't have those extravagant Taj Mahal tents that probably many of you might have, but I... Uh, the tent started collapsing in on itself and there was these crazy lights. I thought a power line had fallen. But I remember ha hearing this rustling just before that and I thought, I should have read that damn book about surviving when a, you know, a mountain lion attacks you or a bear eats you alive and I didn't do that. I'm totally unprepared for this. And this lady next to me in this tent starts screaming and yelling and I thought, what the heck? I picked up my phone and of course, thank you Andy Grignon, uh, I had an iPhone, but it only had 2% battery. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> so, uh, I undid my tent because I'm not scared. And I walked out and looked at the screaming lady, and all of a sudden I hear helicopters and sirens, and I... I I, I shouldn't tell you this, but I actually went to the bathroom w where they had plugs because, you know, obviously with intelligence, you realize if there's no electricity, you probably can plug your iPhone in and charge it, but that was, I was mistaken. <laughs> so then I got in my car and I plugged it in and I waited for it to charge and then I drove to the front and it's electronic gates, so you can't get out. And I called my son. I said, son, are you okay? My son is a a 20-year-old aspiring chef in Napa Valley. And he said, yeah, Mom, I'm okay. I called my friends. I said, are you okay? And they said, no, we're not okay. I said, what's wrong? And they said, we got barrels down. We got water leaking through our ceilings. We got a lot of stuff going on, but don't worry about us. Go check on your stuff. And as soon as I knew that my friends and my family were okay, I waited at the gate for the park ranger to show up, because it was an electronic gate, and you couldn't get it open until the park ranger showed up. Those are the longest 45 minutes I've ever had in my life. Hey, hey. Yep. Yep, yep. And, uh, Welcome back. With you. I drove the two miles west of me and I was so excited because the parking lot was empty and I thought surely the parking lot was empty and there are hundreds of winemakers in this building they would be here so everything is okay I got out of my truck and I walked to the door it's half glass on the top and it's metal on the bottom it's a huge warehouse there are thousands of barrels thousands of dreams And I looked in the door. And all of the air left my body. Because everything that I had left for, I mean, I leaped. I sold my house. I quit my job. I bought a one-way ticket. And I took one suitcase and said, I, all I know is that I'm alive when I make wine. I'm alive when I'm in a vineyard, and i got to go there. Come hell or high water. And so I looked in the door, and there were just thousands of barrels upon, on top of each other. Just, And my barrels are in the first. There were 16 Sarah Francis barrels in the first two rows. I could see them. There were hundreds of barrels on top of my two rows, and there were barrels missing. And you could see in the front of you, right, right between me and this guy in the maroon shirt here, and there were two Sarah Francis barrels just floating. And when I say floating, I mean a foot deep of wine. 
And I just, I, I was so overcome that I had no, no ability to hold myself up anymore. And I fell to my knees, and when I did, and my knees hit the pavement, they hit dampness, it was wet. And then when I looked down, there was wine flowing out the door. We pumped two or three 20,000 gallon tanks. From, because when the power fails, you're, you don't have any reserve pumps. So um, all the drains are backed up and that's why the wine, when the barrels busted open, the wine's just flowing out there. And I had, I think this is probably one of the things that has connected me to farmer to farmer and winemaker to winemaker. I had so many people calling me, knew I was there. I don't know how they knew I was there. Facebook? Maybe yeah, Facebook. Thank you. <laughs> They, um, they were calling me and saying, are my barrels okay? Right? Just like you would call your team to make sure your kids are okay. Because everybody's life is in there. And um, I said, I think it's going to be okay. I think it looks a lot worse than it actually is. But I think, realistically, we're all going to come with a loss. In your case, what was the loss? $875,000. And I was the least impacted. Uh, when you think about that, so wine is about the fruit cost, the barrel cost, and you know all of your expenses that go into it. So I remember a lot of winemakers in that facility that actually had more volume loss and lost a lot more barrels than I did. But their wines don't come from the same vineyards and they don't have the same expenses involved in the farming of their product. Um, when you look at Sarah Francis wine barrel and you think about the gallons that are in that, that's 60 gallons per barrel. It's $1,000 per gallon. And to see that floating around and not have any control, not be able to get into the building, not understand why, you know, all these questions happen um, in your mind, but you just pull yourself together and you say, I did not, I did not come this far to fail now. Yeah! So, so the wine we're about to drink was where in this warehouse? It was in those 16 barrels and it survived. I had, a, the majority of my barrels actually survived uh, the problem was that I had a few barrels that lost volume out of them and a few that got damaged and I lost all of my topping wine so I was unable to uh, top up anything. I was also uh, in loss of all my labels, corks, glass. I was about ready, I was getting ready to bottle when this happened and so uh, all my materials were on site and prepped and so uh, it's not unusual in that regard because I've, I've uh, faced um, i faced tragedy before when making wine. So, um, but the good news is that I was able to be real, and that's the the treasure of having solid customers uh, and people that are just they're beyond customers. They're your friends. And they invested in you a long time ago, before you were anything. So Sam Levin and I both had five thousand dollars in in one of these barrels. Yes. Right. And we, we started texting each other, and we go, we just lost five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's not about they them them acknowledging that there's a potential loss for them. It was, don't worry. And I don't. I can't tell you how much I needed to hear that. I wasn't worried. I needed this wine at this party, and I <laughs> something was looking out for it. And something indeed was looking out for it. And so I want to thank you for your patience. Um, and I also want to thank you for supporting me. Many of you don't even know me personally, but you believe in me, and I can feel it. Yeah. For that, I think. We're going to pour this wine. Now, last week I took 75 people to um, 
uh, the, the Steve Wynn's first sommelier who owns the wor world's largest whiskey collection in Las Vegas. And he's a professor at UNLV in the food and beverage program, and he tell teaches the sommeliers how to and everybody how to how to drink alcohols. It, this technique doesn't just work with wines; it works with whiskeys, vodkas, rums, whatever you whatever you're into. And I want to teach you this technique so that you can really taste this wine. Because this is art, this is wine as art, and you very rarely get to taste wine of this caliber, right? Particularly with this larger group because of the economics involved. Because it usually costs a lot of money to do this, and you don't have the product to ser serve large groups. But I made it happen. She did. Yeah. Yeah. The old technique of tasting wine is to smell it, look at it, and then taste it. The new technique is you do not smell the wine. You take a little tiny sip. You don't smell the wine like this. You take a little tiny sip and you keep it in the front of your mouth for 15 seconds, which is a long time, especially when you all want to talk to each other. Oh my God, you all have glasses. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The rest of this technique, so you keep the, the liquid in your mouth for 15 seconds, that alone will force you to concentrate on tasting it. It'll also heat up the wine so that the molecules that this lady created, which is the art, start vibrating in a higher uh, state. And they also um, split apart. So if those molecules are clumped together, this technique splits the molecules apart. 